Hello and welcome. My name is Jonathan Dyer. I'm Managing Editor of The World. This is a Facebook Live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic, hospital front lines during the surge. With me is Dr. Paul Bidiger, Director of the MGH Centre for Disaster Medicine. You can post your questions for Paul and me on Facebook at Forum, HSPH, and at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by The Forum and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and WGBH. And we're doing this on Zoom through Facebook. Uh, Paul, as COVID-19 fatalities surge here in Massachusetts and elsewhere, what's it like on the front lines in the hospitals? It's uh, really unlike anything I have ever imagined in healthcare. Um, I think uh, we are extraordinarily busy uh, in certain areas of the hospital and extraordinarily quiet in others. Uh, most notably, of course, uh, are the intensive care units. Um, my hospital has 170 uh, patients with uh, COVID with critical illness, uh, more than 400 patients with COVID overall. And although my hospital is a large hospital, we have a thousand beds that puts it in uh, the larger tier of American hospitals. Um, having 150 ICU beds at baseline um, having more than 170 just with COVID presents an enormous challenge. Uh, so, so really that part is, is extraordinarily, I would say, uh, busy but focused. Uh, and then given all of the other normal care we deliver that has been deferred in many other parts of the hospital, it's actually quite quiet. And besides the beds, what kind of staffing challenges does that pose? So, so it creates uh, several, uh, no question. Uh, we've had to create outside of our existing ICUs five different uh, surge ICUs in either recovery spaces for anesthesia or medical floors. Um, and uh, certainly all of those spaces need to have critical care physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists. Uh, but we have had to augment that those staff uh, with other physicians and nurses who don't normally work in the ICU environment. And sometimes we recalled people who used to work in the ICUs, but now work in a different practice setting, but have the experience. Uh, and sometimes we have folks who work in similar but slightly uh, different care areas uh, paired up with ICU, uh, especially nurses. As you experience the surge in patients, we've had more than a thousand deaths uh, in the state of Massachusetts. What, um, where do you think we are on the so-called curve and, and how that is looking and whether we're close to a peak or where that might be or if, if, we're, if we're not there now? Sure. So, so we uh, are fortunate to have a group of healthcare systems engineers within our, our system uh, that are really extraordinary and have gathered data from other parts of the world that were earlier uh, in the outbreak than we are. We compare our numbers constantly to where they are. So, so I feel reasonably confident in our modeling, and, and we still think we're probably about a week away from the peak uh, of the curve, uh, and, and actually the peak of critical illness may be another several days to week beyond that. Uh, unfortunately, it takes a few more days for people to get sicker. So uh, we're still at the top uh, of the curve for a while. Um, uh, and you know, one of the things that's important to note is, is when you flatten the curve, instead of being sharp, uh, tall and spiky, it flattens out. But that means you're at the top for a longer period of time. Uh, that, that's certainly going to be a challenge. And as you, as you treat these patients, what are you learning about the course of COVID-19 and how it affects people and why people end up in the ICU and why people don't? So, so uh, there's some that we know and there's so much that we don't know. Uh, again, I think everyone is familiar that rising age uh, is a risk factor as well as multiple other medical conditions like diabetes or heart disease or, or lung disease. Um, but, but really, uh, we still see a number of healthy people in there 40s, 50s, uh, who, who have severe illness uh, and, and plenty more who do not. Um, there are parts of this disease that we really don't understand. Uh, there are people who look pretty good, uh, look like they should be having a conversation like you and I are, but their oxygen levels are dangerously low and why they don't feel more short of breath, why they don't feel worse for what normally would be really uh, you know, a panicking lab value to clinicians, we don't know. Um, we do also, uh, we're continually learning that there are unusual parts of this disease process that, that no one had anticipated with a coronavirus before. Uh, these patients make clots uh, more easily uh, than uh, other infectious disease patients. Uh, they sometimes have cardiac, and now we're learning more about neurologic complications. So there, there's just so much, unfortunately, we don't know about either why it hits people so hard or really what the ultimate uh, disease manifestations are going to be.
What kind of neurologic complications have you noticed? So, so I think it's really early uh, to, to know for sure, but we've seen some confusion, some disorientation. Uh, it's, it's not that uncommon for people to be somewhat confused after coming out of the intensive care unit setting. Uh, it's, it's obviously a, a bewildering experience for everyone, but some people seem to have had some prolonged cognitive effects. And, and again, uh, given the fact that we've only been going through this for four or six weeks at, at this level, um, I, I think there's a lot that we still have to see. Okay, let's get to some questions coming in uh, on the line. Uh, uh, this one is about um, Governor Baker's announcement earlier this week that uh, Massachusetts will join a coalition of eastern states working together to coordinate the lifting of stay-at-home orders and other restrictions. What's your take on that? How important is this collaboration across straight state lines? And what are the big challenges uh, from the perspective of someone in your position in the hospital? So I think it's extremely important that we think about uh, restarting carefully. Uh, part of the reason that our curve is, is flatter, part of the reason that we are not critically out of resources uh, is the physical distancing uh, that is the result of what Governor Baker and other uh, municipal leaders uh, have, have done. Um, you know, basically, uh, our projections early in the outbreak suggested we would be on a curve much closer to northern Italy, um, and, and the fact that we're not really is, is the result of a lot of these policies. Therefore, letting up on them too early could really be damaging, uh, could really risk a lot of health uh, for people uh, in, across the whole region. Certainly here in New England uh, and even in the Northeast, our states are relatively smaller and so a little inconsistency among places that are only 50, 100 miles apart uh, could, could threaten to undermine uh, the effectiveness of the system. So it's really important that we act in concert. It's also really important that we try and follow the same uh, advice. Uh, no one has ever, of course, tried to reopen society uh, before because we've never had to react like this before. Um, but, but trying to make sure we know when we can safely restart, <clears throat> excuse me, other parts of healthcare, when we can restart other parts of society is really important. And do you have any sense of, you said it, it, we don't want to do it too early. Do you know when it's too early? Do you have any sense of where we should be on the curve before we can begin to think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are parts of too early that are quite easy to define. I, I think we have to really know that we're solidly in uh, the improving phase. That means at least two weeks uh, worth of decreasing numbers of cases just to make sure that we, we don't get lulled into a, a false sense of security by a couple of days worth of a blip of data. Uh, secondly, I think we have to really know we can deliver healthcare. Uh, right now, we're doing extraordinary things uh, to deliver the care to the patients who need it, um, but these things are not going to be infinitely sustainable uh, in the long term. So we have to know that, that as we get closer to normal healthcare, and I use that, those words extremely carefully, um, we have to know that we can deliver care to everyone who needs it, both with COVID and not with non-COVID for, for emergency illness. Um, then we have to know that our supply chains uh, are good. We have to know that we can provide personal protective equipment. We can provide medications uh, to our staff, to our patients. Uh, those things are really important. And lastly, I think we have to really feel confident uh, about where we are with testing, uh, that, that we know better than we do right now what's the burden of disease in our communities, uh, who is becoming immune, who is not, um, so that we can, with some degree of certainty, model what, what might happen next. And when you say testing, are, we, is it, are you just really focusing on testing as to knowing who has the disease? Or are you also thinking of antibody testing, knowing people who might not know that they had it, but might have some level of immunity? Uh, absolutely. I, I really, all of it. I, I think we, one of the challenges is exactly what you point out, that um, we're all using testing, but we mean something slightly different. Uh, if we mean viral detection, which is does someone actively have an infection, we need to continue to do that, no question. We need to make sure we know who is infected uh, and, and we can identify everyone who's infected. Uh, but uh, we absolutely need what, what a lot of us are, you know, use the term serology testing to mean, which is antibody testing. Uh, there are two kinds of antibodies, a, a short-term and a long-term antibody. Um, we, have to, we have to start being able to do that testing. And then ultimately, actually, there's a third variable that's extremely important, which is to hopefully correlate the antibody testing with immunity. Uh, that right now, just because we pick up antibodies in the bloodstream does not effectively mean uh, that we know someone is immune. Uh, and we have to study that to know uh, what this, this testing means in terms of people's health. Right. We've had a few questions coming in about uh, the, the staffing of, of, of hospitals and uh, the kind of equipment that they have. Uh, uh, this question comes in from Greg. He says, my wife is a nurse in a New Jersey nursing home. With the current infection rate in my state exploding daily, especially in nursing homes, and knowing that the staffs in these facilities are not utilizing full PPE and being provided with only one face mask a day, 
what are the chances of her being infected and what can she do to realistically protect herself from infection? Yeah, you know, my heart goes out to, to Greg and his wife and, and to everyone who's, who's on the front lines. I think clearly uh, everyone is aware of the challenges of, of available personal protective equipment in so many different healthcare settings. Um, for uh, masks and, and, and respirators that uh, are not involved in aerosol generating procedures, uh, the CDC guidance does permit extended use uh, up to a, a day uh, in, in, uh, the, for the course of a shift. I think obviously it's extremely important to follow the uh, the basic rules that uh, that we all know now, which is don't touch the front of the mask. Make sure obviously you keep your hands away. Use hand hygiene. So in other words, wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer before you ever get up and, and touch around your mask. Uh, make sure you're using gowns and gloves uh, with uh, with touching patients, and then really uh, make sure uh, that. Um, you are aware of what's an aerosol generating procedure and not because that's the difference uh, when uh, the CDC indicates a simple surgical face mask versus an N95 respirator is required. Uh, lastly, uh, just mucous membrane uh, protection, specifically eye protection, is really, really important. Uh, you can have extended use of eye protection as well, but wear that mask, wear the goggles, use gown and gloves, change them. Uh, Consistent with the CDC guidance, that's protective. And of course, just incredibly good attention to hand hygiene as, as we've all been saying for so long, just wash those hands, wash those hands, be careful of where you're touching. Um, and on the topic of uh, staffing, this question comes from Ariel Hart from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. You mentioned the need to recall people with experience in the past in critical care or experience in similar disciplines. We've heard reports of hospitals short of staffing with their ICU care, with clinicians or with no critical care or critical care adjacent experience. Can you comment on that? Mm -hmm. Basically, so, there's sort of people without the right skill set being in positions where they might not. Um, sure. Uh, so, so obviously, I, I, I couldn't comment on, on every hospital ac across the country, but I know for, for our system and our strategy, uh, again, there always are critical care specialty trained physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists uh, in every one of the ICUs, and, and they direct and, and, and deliver the care. Uh, however, uh, as, as many people are probably aware, um, ICU care is, is labor intensive. So turning a patient, uh, providing all of the daily routine uh, requires a, a lot of bodies. Uh, and we can uh, pair up nurses who don't traditionally work in ICU settings with an ICU nurse to help with some of these tasks. Um, so that, again, there's always someone who's very comfortable with the medicines that we're using, the monitors, the ventilator management, et cetera. Uh, but, but he or she has an, another set of hands or, or two to help them make sure the work gets done as well. And speaking of ICUs, last week, um, uh, health officials put out guidelines about which um, patients should get priority if there was a shortage of ventilators and ICU beds. Um, that seemed like a real ethical, a whole bunch of ethical learners for doctors to deal with that they wouldn't have not, not have had to in the past. What's your take on, on those guidelines? So, so I think this clearly is, is about as hard as it ever gets uh, in medicine, maybe in society, uh, is to make uh, choices about what, what you do with the resources that you're running out of. Uh, I think, you know, this has been uh, known to be a problem for quite some time. Uh, back even, it honestly started with the first SARS virus outbreak in Toronto when a group of ethicists and others uh, started to publish on this. The Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academies, published three different sets of guidelines in starting, I believe, in 2006. So th there's been a topic of conversation for an extraordinarily long period of time um, uh, about how you would approach it, how you would do it. Uh, but clearly, of course, it's, it's been uh, shoved to the fore with what we've seen with, with COVID-19. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, everyone should know that, that it is every single uh, healthcare leader, hospital leader, physician, nurse uh, is a uh, goal to maximize resource availability. Uh, and so especially for somebody like me who spends his life planning for disasters, my goal has always been to do the very most I could ever do uh, and, and, and make sure we have resources. My own system, uh, you know, tried to purchase another 200 ventilators on top of the uh, ones that we already had as we headed into this. Thankfully, uh, I would note right now uh, that in New England, in Massachusetts, where I am, uh, we do not believe we're going to reach a point where we do not have the resources available. And, and so that's, uh, and, and I hope, I sincerely hope that, that that's true. Uh, but, but if indeed we're running out of resources, I think we have to know that we can make a set of consistent uh, choices across the healthcare community that are fair, that are ethical, that are transparent to everyone uh, involved. Um, certainly no one wants a circumstance where they worry if, if uh, they'd taken their loved one or if they themselves had gone to a different hospital, they might get access to resources at one, but not, not at another. 
Um, so, so trying to do that, that that's extraordinary hard. Uh, there are lots and lots of voices. And I think, you know, importantly, there are a lot of really, really good voices out there talking about the equity of the situation overall. Uh, that, that some of the most affected communities in, in the country uh, and even in parts of the world are, are those uh, who are already uh, disadvantaged in, in different ways. Um, that the, you know, legacy of race, legacy of um, lots of historical inequalities that, that have disadvantaged people's health um, shouldn't further disadvantage them uh, if they are, are trying to access necessary resources. So I, I think, again, equity is an extremely important consideration here, uh, especially given the vulnerable populations. And, and I think these kinds of rules have to do everything they can to promote, to, to protect equity, uh, if, if uh, ever the healthcare system were to be in that circumstance. Thank you. And in fact, we'll, we'll be addressing that, that very equity issue uh, in a later Facebook Live uh, Q&A, which I'll tell you about at the end of this Facebook Live Q&A. Um, uh, new question now from Michael Cahill, state representative from New Hampshire, who writes, many hospitals have experienced substantial revenue loss due to the cancellation of elective procedures. They're seeking reimbursement and furloughing staff while at the same time asking medical personnel to come out of retirement or go where current hotspots are. Would it not be possible to have done short-term stay procedures, keeping those patients segregated from COVID-19 sufferers? So, so I think that that's a, it's a complex question, no question. Uh, there, there are huge revenue losses no, uh, across healthcare um, uh, because of, of, of how it's been disrupted. Uh, but I, I think you know, it, it is an absolutely a best practice to try and segregate COVID and non-COVID uh, patients whenever possible. Uh, most health, healthcare systems, most recommendations say uh, to have uh, COVID units within hospitals, uh, COVID uh, evaluation units, so before someone is confirmed, uh, have them on precautions so that ideally it's protective. However, uh, it's really been extremely hard to create COVID, excuse me, COVID specialty hospitals. Um, and the reason for that, again, comes back to asymptomatic transmission. One of the other extraordinarily surprising things about COVID is how many people can have the illness but really have no symptoms. And so at my own hospital, we've had a patient with appendicitis, we've had a patient uh, with a stroke, we've had a patient with a heart attack uh, who've all had COVID and no symptoms. And we discover it for a variety of different reasons, uh, almost accidentally initially. Um, and, and so because you have to continue to deliver normal medical care, patients that look like they have ordinary diseases, but then also turn out to have COVID at the same time, means that really it's almost impossible, practically speaking, to have a hospital or even a, a set of hospitals only take care of COVID and others not. But within the hospital, as we do our diagnostics, as we do our evaluation, absolutely really important to have COVID and non-COVID units uh, segregated uh, whenever possible. That makes sense. Um, we'll try to get through, through as many questions as we can, uh, but we still have an opportunity if you ask a question uh, on Facebook for anyone uh, watching. Here on Facebook is the best, pay, best place to pose a question uh, to Paul. Uh, let's get to another question now. Uh, this one is, again, it's about separating the healthy from the unhealthy. Uh, this question from Robert, can EMT nurses and physicians caring for COVID-19 patients take any prophylactic medication to, become, to prevent becoming infected with COVID-19? I wish there were, uh, of course, uh, you know, the protection uh, of the healthcare workforce of those folks who are, who are putting themselves out there to care for those who are sick uh, is one of the most important priorities any, any healthcare system uh, can have. Um, there is unfortunately no uh, proven prophylactic medication. And, and as most everybody knows, unfortunately, there really is no proved uh, therapeutic medication once uh, infection is confirmed. Uh, there's an enormous amount of research, obviously, right now looking at different antivirals. Uh, of course, hydroxychloroquine has gotten attention in the media. There are others. Uh, but until we have data saying uh, that there is either an effective prophylactic or treatment, uh, we are stuck with what we call supportive care, which I, I don't mean to minimize. This is extraordinarily high-tech intensive care unit care, um, but it means that we don't have an effective direct attack on the virus itself. We, we hear so many really heart-wrenching stories of people uh, dropping off loved ones at the hospital and never seeing them again, never holding their hand as they pass away. Uh, this question comes up from online. Are hospitals considering hospice in the ER for elderly patients? Are there options for families other than dropping their elderly, elderly relative at the ER and possibly never seeing them again? So, so there are uh, hospitals that have pursued uh, hospice uh, and palliative care uh, services in the emergency department. Uh, my own uh, hospital makes palliative care services in the emergency department available. 
Uh, and, and for exactly that reason that we want to really make sure we're paying attention to the, to the patient's wishes, family wishes, uh, and, and that we're able to uh, provide these moments together uh, wherever possible, uh, if, if in fact uh, that's, that's what the patient's condition uh, indicates. Um, you know, it, it is absolutely heart-wrenching uh, that on top of the loss uh, comes the loss of the ability to be together at that time. Uh, so we're certainly trying to do what we can. Uh, it, it isn't a substitute uh, for physical contact, of course, but iPads, video connections, anything we can do to bring people together, we, we are trying to do. Uh, and, and then again, for uh, end of life situations, we do permit uh, a family, mem family member to come in uh, with the palliative care support, with the hospice support. We've had people online asking about this uh, new study out of the University of Washington, I think, uh, that uh, projected uh, much higher numbers uh, in Massachusetts uh, that have been projected locally. Um, and there's some dispute about whether, because it's, it, it, they're basing it on the fact that Massachusetts is not putting in a sort of compulsory stay-at-home order, it's, it's making a sort of a recommendation. What's your take on that particular study uh, and the numbers it's putting in? Yeah, so, so the, the numbers I have access to aren't for the whole state, they're only for my healthcare system, which has uh, about eight acute care hospitals uh, around the state in it. Um, but, uh, you know, when we started our modeling early, I think, as I said uh, a bit ago, uh, we looked uh, like all of our hospitals looked like we were on a curve with northern Italy, uh, which would uh, really max out uh, everything we could possibly do for ICU capacity, floor capacity, emergency department, et cetera. Um, and uh, within about one to two weeks following the stay-at-home order by our governor, by our municipal leaders, um, we, we started to see us moving off of that curve. And we've, we've now moved dramatically off of that curve, really uh, at a projected peak uh, of potentially less than half of where we thought we were. Uh, so, so I think we've, we've absolutely, in the data, as I interpret our data, we, we've made huge amounts of progress uh, in, in getting off that worst case scenario um, and in staving off that, that very tall, narrow peak that we were so afraid of. Um, I, I can't speak to you know, what, what could have happened otherwise, but, but I know, you know looking at that, at that study uh, that, that said that things really are, are, are worse than we had previously projected, that's, that's not at least consistent with the data I have within my healthcare system. Do you have any sense of how the curve looks once we get past the peak? Does it level off and stay there? Does it dip and flatten out? Does, do we get many other mini peaks? So, so I think there, there probably are, are short-term and, and longer-term ways to try and answer that question, uh, both of which, uh, unfortunately and probably frustratingly, end with the answer of I don't really know. Uh, but um, in the short term, uh, we have pretty good confidence looking a week to two ahead of ourselves uh, at any given time. Uh, and so far, our curve looks like sort of a gradual up and a gradual down, uh, which still is, again, much better than a big, sharp uh, up that, that exceeds our capacity. Uh, but, of course, a gradual down means that we're probably six weeks uh, until we get even close to, to, to getting to the tail end of it. Now, we contrast that with uh, the Italian experience, where actually once they started declining, their numbers started declining quite quickly. Uh, but I would say their peak was a little sharp, uh, was short, uh, sorry, more narrow and, and taller than ours. Um, we would love to see a big, fast uh, 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 fall off in cases. But... Part of the challenge is that these patients have, have much longer hospitalization than many tip, uh, other kinds of infectious disease patients. Uh, and so we expect the surge will be with us for a while. On that longer term answer, uh, uh, that's, that's even harder. I think it, it's almost inevitable there will be other waves, uh, but how tall they are uh, and how disruptive they are uh, is, is impossible to know, especially until we get better data about really uh, how many people have been infected already across our communities and how many are, are potentially immune. So when you speak about the sort of the broader peak potentially being with us for a while, how long are you thinking? I, I mean, I think uh, certainly through uh, the end of May is, is what it's going to take for my healthcare system to start getting back down uh, to kind of earlier March numbers. Uh, what that means in terms of when we can actually resume more of our clinical activities that we were doing, uh, you know, during February uh, that's even harder to predict uh, because, again, we just we have to know for certain that our healthcare environment remains a safe place to deliver care. Um, we've been, on on that topic. We've got uh, this question that's come in. I've heard that some people are afraid to go to the ER now for things like injuries and chest pain. They're worried about catching the virus that causes COVID nineteen. Using that at MGH, and what would you say to people who are worried about visiting the ER? So we've certainly seen a drop-off in our emergency department volume. I think almost every emergency department has. 
Um, I, I, I really would hate to think uh, that someone staves off a life-saving emergency department visit because they're worried about getting COVID. Um, here in our hospital, in many hospitals, all of our staff are masked, uh, all of our patients are masked. Obviously we have extraordinary envi uh, environmental cleaning uh, and, and we are looking for any chance that there's a lot of, or almost really any uh, healthcare associated infection of COVID uh, and we're not seeing that signal in our data. So, uh, you know, hospitals are safe places to be and, and, and if you think you have a life-threatening condition, you should, should absolutely seek medical care. Um, the, the alternative could be much, much worse. Um, this question is coming from Facebook. Is anyone doing a research project about the transmission of the coronavirus within hospitals by repeatedly doing point of care COVID-19 tests to understand the transmission, the transmission among hospital workers and patients? So, so, so people are absolutely studying. We look at our healthcare worker infection data extremely closely uh, to try and make sure that, that there aren't signals that suggest one area is particularly at risk or one role group or, or one procedure and anything that we can identify. And we, and we do the exact same thing for our patients. Uh, if ever uh, someone develops COVID symptoms or is, is diagnosed with COVID after their hospitalization initially, uh, we go through the record very, very closely to see if they came in with it, if they developed it in hospital and, and drill down on every single one of those. Uh, so, so again, there are no signals in our data yet uh, that, that would suggest that uh, there is significant in-hospital COVID transmission uh, or significant transmission to our healthcare workers, but we're, we're looking at it extremely closely. What I would say also is that um, we have um, really seen a drop off in all infections uh, with masking. So first, when we put masks on our healthcare workers, huge change. And, and more recently, as we put patient, uh, masks on our patients, huge change. So, you know, these are consistent with other people's data as well, but, but really re, uh, reassuring. I sense that we're going to be wearing masks for a, a long time to come. Um, how, you mentioned, we've been speaking about testing a bit. How available are tests? Are there people who want to be tested who are not getting it? Are, peop, are only people with severe symptoms being tested? What, what's the current protocol around testing people? So, so there are still limitations on testing uh, and, and they come from various sources. Uh, sometimes it's the swabs, literally the uh, little piece of, uh, of, of uh, plastic and, and uh, uh, vinyl that lets us uh, swab, for the, swab for the virus. Sometimes it's the testing centers uh, the, or the lab availability. Sometimes it's the number of people. Sometimes it's actually the number of personal protective equipment devices available. We have to have gowns and gloves and, and, and the rest. Um, and, and so until all of those factors uh, start to become more, uh, more consistent, uh, we're going to have some limitations. But, but you know, all of us are trying to look at how we can study the healthcare workforce to identify uh, who has previously been infected, who might be infected now. Uh, certainly our communities, we have communities very near us that are very hard hit and we have to really roll out aggress aggressive testing strategies as we're partnering with the, the municipal leadership of several of our communities to do. Um, we, we need more testing uh, and, and we're trying to roll that out as, as best we can. And speaking of the healthcare workers, and this is going to be a final question, unfortunately, because we're just about out of time. Uh, how are healthcare workers at MGH holding up? How are they doing emotionally? And this, uh, and this uh, correspondent asks online, what can the community do to support them? Well, well thank you certainly uh, for the offer of support. I, I think people are holding up. Uh, it, it's an extraordinary time, but I, I think most people working in, in, in the hospital, and, and this certainly it includes our respiratory therapists and our nurses uh, and our doctors, but I think it really includes our security and our buildings and grounds and environmental services and just staff throughout the hospital uh, understand the mission and, and are pushing through because of it. Uh, but but I think it's also pretty fair to say that people are pretty tired uh, and, and people uh, have concerns about how much longer this uh, degree of stress, uh, this degree of work is going gonna, is gonna to last. Uh, I think, um, I may have said this before, but, but I think the expressions of support, the expressions of, uh, of gratitude are extremely meaningful. And, and I don't mean to say that healthcare uh, workers are, are the only ones who deserve them. As you know, many others have said, it's the people working in the grocery store, making sure we get our food, making sure that, that all those essential items we need uh, are taken care of. But you know, just as an example, last night, uh, our uh, Boston uh, police and fire and EMS uh, did a procession uh, by the, the city's hospitals. And it was really meaningful, um, you know, just as, as sort of a gesture of, of, of mutual support. Uh, for us, it was also the uh, seventh uh, anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing, um, which is another very important event for, for us here. Uh, but, but showing the solidarity, showing that, that people are 
uh, recognized. Uh, that, that means a lot to everybody. And so uh, please, uh, you know, con continue to send those wishes to the, to the healthcare workers in your lives. Um, I, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. And thank you for all the work you do and uh, everyone who works with you. Um, and that concludes our Facebook discussion. Thank you again, Paul, for fielding everyone, fielding everyone's diverse uh, questions. This Q&A has been jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and WGBH. You can view the full discussion on our Facebook pages and send feedback to at Forum, HSPH, and at PRI The World. Join us again on Tuesday, April 28th at noon ET, when we will talk with Mary Bassett, director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. Let's keep the conversation going. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you.